In the name of Christ, amen. As we begin this new calendar year of 2024, I want to take a moment to look at our gospel reading for the day. I think in it we are able to see in the newness of Mary and Joseph and their new family coming to the temple. I think there are some wonderful insights into how we can have newness, how we can have something maybe different for the year ahead. I know we all make resolutions, and I also know how well those go. We usually last, what, a week, two, sometimes maybe a few months. But instead of the typical New Year's resolution or everything's just going to be different next year because this year was not so good, whatever we typically say to ourselves to approach a new calendar year. I think we find in the Gospel of Luke, in this section of Scripture, some wonderful insights into what could truly make a year new. In fact, even better than new, a year where we could have what Mary had when she came to this, this, to the temple, when she presented her son. And we're told that after she heard the words of Simeon in verse 33, that Jesus' father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Wouldn't it be great to have a year in which you marveled more? Marveled meaning wonder, astounded, amazed. Marvelous is a word we get for marveled. But one of the frustrating things about our life in the Christian faith is that we love to complain about the world, don't we? We can go on for hours complaining about how terrible the world is getting and how this is bad and, and of course everything was better when we were young, right? Doesn't matter what generation you are, it was better in the good old days. We love to complain, but seldom do we ever really do much about it, because it's hard. How much of this last year did you just spend in time and activities that were not thought out, were not intentional, were not uh, accomplishing much, didn't deepen your faith, didn't serve your neighbor? How much time did you spend last year just existing? Well, I can pretty much guarantee you that any time you spend just existing, especially staring at a screen or, or something of that nature, you're probably not gonna do a lot of marveling. There's not gonna be a whole lot of marvelous, wondrous, amazing things happening in your life when you're just sitting around and existing. So in this text, in Luke 2, 22, we see the beginning of, of the earthly life of the child, Jesus, mom and dad presenting him at the temple. And as we go through this, I want us to consider whether or not there's some very important truths here that could carry us through the coming year so that we might marvel more. Truth number one. We should start every year, in fact, every day, with the law, with confession, with sin. Why were Mary and Joseph at the temple? For the time of purification, to make a sacrifice. It comes from Leviticus 12. The law for her who bears a child, either male or female, and if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering and the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall then be clean. They came to the temple in the first place out of an admission of being sinful, of needing atonement. This is where it all begins. It's where our Christian faith begins, and basically where every day of our life should begin, but especially a new year. It's instead of looking at everybody else and complaining about everybody else, we say, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. 
Imagine if somebody sat you down in front of all your friends and family with a videotape of all your life, all of your private thoughts, all of your private activities, and shared it with everybody. Would you be comfortable? I wouldn't. We're sinners. We're sinners in what we do, and we're sinners for what we don't do. We're sinners for what we fail to do that we should do. And we need to start there with that humbling, depressing thought that we as human beings are broken and we need help. Quite the opposite of a resolution. Here's what I'm going to do. Instead, as Mary and Joseph did, we start with here's what we can't do. In fact, that's what the whole idea of atonement was. They brought these sacrifices to the priest for atonement. These, this sheep, or in the case of those who were poor, a, a, a pigeon or a turtle dove, was pointing, of course, forward to Christ, but it was a, a means of taking the sin off of the individual and having someone else or something else atone for it, to do what we could not do. That's where our text starts, and that's where we should start every year, in fact, every day. I can't do it. I'm not going to keep the resolutions. I'm not capable of being the good person that I want to be, and I am certainly not capable of being the good person that God demands that I be. I have failed. I have sinned. I confess. Now, to many people, that seems depressing. Wow, what a wonderful way to wake up. I stink. I'm a schmuck. Sorry, you are. Depressing or not, remember the creation? What are the two ingredients of the human being? The breath of God and a bucket of dirt. What happens when you take away the breath of God? Dirt. The only thing about ourselves we can take any pride in is the life of Christ and God that dwells within us. And we continually, just like Adam and Eve, like to shoo him away. So we start the year and the days. I'm broken. I'm sinful. Help me. And you know what happens immediately when you do that? God says to you, you got it. Immediately. Because our Lord is a Lord of grace. It's interesting. We have now Mary and Joseph coming to present their sacrifice. And then they meet these two interesting characters, Simeon and Anna. And Simeon, probably freaking out Mary, comes up and grabs her child. Can you imagine someone doing that to you just out of the blue at church? Runs up. Actually, people do do that at church, I've noticed. Some of our uh, older ladies will just take babies out of mother's arms and pass them around. And I'm going, oh no, oh no. But the mothers often seem to be okay with it. Like they're so tired, they're just take it, take them, just go. But Simeon comes up and takes the baby Jesus in his hands and says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. This phrase, this series of verses have been part of Christian liturgy in various church services for thousands of years. We call it the nuc dimittis, which in Latin means the, the now dismiss. And it is Simeon coming to Mary and Joseph and letting them know that the Messiah has come. That while they are there to sacrifice these animals for their sins, the one who would bring grace has come. Not only does he say this, he takes him up in his arms. So we go from a period of time after the fall where it is made very clear to everyone in every story of Old Testament history and later in New Testament, every human attempt to try to be godly, every human attempt to try to do the right thing, every human attempt to be spiritual and good, failure after failure after failure. God gives them the sacrifices of the temple and gives them this shadow of the reality that would come. 
And those people in that old time got to see a little teeny bit of what was coming in the sacrifice of the lamb, the Passover, the temple sacrifices, the idea of atonement. But now, what was once just a shadow, Simeon is holding in his arms. And that's what the gospel is. Our atonement, the grace that we receive from God is not some religious idea or a theology or a doctrine. We literally hold it in our arms. When we take the Lord's Supper today, we will be holding the very body and blood of Christ in our hands. Our atonement, our grace. When we hold the word of God, even though it's just human paper and ink, in it is the living, breathing grace and forgiveness of God. We can hold our grace in our hands because of what Christ did upon the cross. And then Anna comes out of the woodwork, this prophetess that has been basically living at the temple, rent-free. No, I don't know. Maybe they charged her rent. I don't know how that worked. But she's been there every day waiting for this hour. And she comes up, gives thanks to God, and then starts speaking to everyone about the redemption, the grace that has come to Jerusalem. But here's what's interesting. If you take these two names, Simeon, which which is uh, from an ancient Hebrew word, Shema, and there's a a very uh, ancient but common Jewish prayer known as the Shema that you may have actually heard. Uh, It is the centerpiece of the morning and evening Jewish prayer services, and it's the first verse that encapsulates kind of the monotheism of Judaism going back thousands of years. And it's the Jewish prayer, hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. And this idea, this word Shema simply means hear. And that's where the name Simeon comes from, is Shema, to hear. Anna, on the other hand, comes from the Hebrew word chana, or which was later um, in, in the Greek turned to Hanna or Anna, and then uh, the Latin just turned it into Anna always. But that original Hebrew word where the, word, where the name Anna comes from means favor or grace. So these two strange people that come out of nowhere when Poor Mary and Joseph were there amongst the crowds with the baby Jesus. The two people that come to welcome them, their names together literally say, hear, grace. Interesting. Because that is exactly why Christ did come. He came into the law. He came in through the flesh of Mary, into what was broken, what what could not achieve anything it sought to do ultimately, had no hope of anything eternal. And this Christ comes and brings grace. And how does he bring that grace? Through his word, we hear grace. The atonement, grace, went from a shadow, a pointing forward off into the distance, to a reality that both Simeon and we today can literally hold in our hands. But from grace then comes faith. By grace, God creates faith. We're told in verse 25, this man whose name was Simeon was righteous and devout and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. We're also told that Anna and her proclamation to the people speaks of the waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. There's a lot of waiting mentioned in the text. The waiting. I hate to wait. Hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. I get so annoyed when I'm waiting. Most of the trouble I got in as a child was because I had to wait for something and just could not help myself. But isn't waiting just the worst? Standing in line, the DMV. If the DMV does not turn you to Christ, I don't know what will. That's my image of hell. No offense, if you work at the DMV, you're doing a fine job. But I don't like to wait. But here's the thing. When God creates faith in us by his grace, 
Faith is, in most circumstances, a willingness to wait. They say, well, what does faith have to do with waiting? Well, faith is trusting in something that is not yet here. Faith is trusting in what you can't see. Faith is trusting in what you can't comprehend. If you can do it yourself, if it's here right now, you can touch it. Well, that's not faith. Faith is a willingness to wait. Jude 20, uh, verse 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Faith is a willingness to wait. The truth is, when you're waiting, God is working. That's why faith involves a lot of waiting. Because God is the one doing the work. All of those people that were waiting for the redemption of Israel, waiting for grace, it was because they could not do it themselves. So God picked the perfect time to bring his son, fully human, fully man, and put him upon the cross to forgive all of our sins. In fact, in the ancient Greek, the word wait, uh, uh, prostekamai, literally means to receive forward. I love that. It's like I've already got it, but it's still in the future. It hasn't happened yet, but I see it as already happened. That's what faith is. But we've got to be willing to wait. We've got to be willing to say, okay, Lord, I trust you. Let's see what you do. Lord, I trust you. I'm going to go about loving my neighbor and reading your word, coming together with my fellow Christians in your church, doing my job, being a parent, being a child, whatever it might be, and I am waiting upon your will. Because I know and trust that it will be done. But while we're waiting, we need to prepare ourselves for more piercings. Mary, after receiving this glorious news about her child, is told in verse 35, and a sword will pierce through your own soul so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Was that not a prophecy that came true in spades? Imagine Mary standing there at the foot of the cross, watching her son pierced for our sins, having no idea what was really going on, seeing him humiliated, stripped, tortured, spit on. Imagine how that that must have torn Mary apart. Even his friends abandoned him. I love that verse that just simply says, at the foot of the cross stood his mother. Her heart was pierced. But here's the thing. (coughs) Hebrews 4.12 tells us, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If we are people of faith, a faith that has come from grace, waiting on the will of God to be done in a world that does not share our faith, in a sinful world, guess what's going to happen? It's going to hurt. People of faith living in a world without Christ are never going to do so in absolute comfort. In fact, one of the few places we find it is in the gathering of the church. But other than that, if you have no piercing, if you feel no pain, what does that really say? Because the people of grace, the people of faith, the people that are waiting on God and not on the world, to do what needs to be done. Being a part of a sinful world is going to hurt. Which leads to the last thing that I think our text teaches us. The fact that Simeon and Anna both 
faithfully waiting, both depending on the Lord, but they also depended on the devout. Where do we find Simeon and Anna? In the temple, in the gathering of the fellow believers, those who were closest to God, those who were who were seeing so clearly the promises given to them by the prophets, they wanted to go nowhere but the place where God's people gathered. The sinful world hurts a lot less when we depend on the devout. When we stick together with people that share our faith, when we stick to people people that have a heart for godliness, when we stick with people that are willing to wait upon the Lord in the faith that is created from the grace that was given, the people who are willing to bow before God every year, every day, and say, I am a sinner, any goodness in me depends on you. When we are with those people, it is amazing how much easier the piercings become. How much easier the hardship becomes. How much easier it is to bear the difficulty of being Christ's hands and arms in a sinful world. The people of faith, the people of grace, need each other, which is why the church is so important. I like this text for all the reasons mentioned, because I think we have great hope at the year 2024 being marvelous. I want you to marvel more. I want you to have more aspects of your life that fill you with excitement and joy that you want to tell other people about, as opposed to, yeah, same old. I want you to marvel because you have been able to see what God is working in your life, in your day, in your year, because you have been willing to wait on him in faith because of grace, even knowing you don't deserve it. In the name of that Christ, I pray that every one of us has a marvelous year. God's peace be with you. Amen.